Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Hellickson here with Club Wealth Coaching and Consulting. You can see the little sign behind me there. Uh, yes, we are a coaching and consulting company. We uh, help agents grow their business, whether they want to build a team or just become the best solo agent on the planet. That's what we do. We help you guys. We help you grow. Uh, and today with Club Wealth TV, whether you're a client of ours or not, we're going to bring you a ton of value today. We do Club Wealth TV every week. And uh, today we have a very special guest in Brendan Bardick. Bar I, uh, I, did I get that right? Brendan Bardick. Brendan Bartik, yes. Perfect. I want to make sure I pronounce that right. So that being said, we're going to be talking today about building an army of ISAs and how that can help you grow your business. Planet. That's what we do. We help you. Whoa. Guys. And look at this. Somebody uh, has yeah. to mute out Facebook and guess what? It was me. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that? I, I just, shame, shame, shame. I know. I'm embarrassed. I can't believe I did that. So <laughs> anyway, you guys, very excited to have Brendan with us today. And uh, of course, I'm very excited as always to have the hostess with the mostest, Miss Sheree Benjamin with us. Hilarious. Uh, for those of you that don't know, and I saw this, I saw Sheree posted this somewhere the other day. So now I know the real number is over 400 transactions last year. Uh, <laughs> so don't get to mess with me today. I know you and Brian love to mess with me. Uh, but the reality is Sheree, uh, literally just three years ago, best year ever was like 45 transactions. Or no, I'm sorry, 35 transactions. I was going to say, we all, Brian, it's every... Every, every week. It's, Whatever. It's you were doing this much. Now you're doing this much. It's a big difference, right? Okay. So that's really the kind of the point here. And Brian Curtis, of course, and both Brian and Sheree are, are coaches with Club Wealth, as you guys probably already know. Uh, they are in high, high, high demand. Uh, and Brian here did uh, does about 330 transactions uh, a year, just over 300 transactions a year. So anyway, that being said, as we go along here, those of you that are watching on Facebook, if you're watching us live on Facebook right now, do me a favor. And mm -hmm. I want you to type in your questions for us on your screen. The first question I have for everyone watching is, do you have an ISA? If you have at least one ISA, I want you to type yes into your screen and or you could type in how many you have, right? So if you've got three or four ISAs, type that in there. If you have zero ISAs, type in the word zero or none or I don't have any ISAs. Just I want to know who the audience is now and where you're at on the ISA model. That being said, Brendan, please tell us a little bit about you. Welcome to the show. We're glad you're here. Tell us who you are, what company you're with. And how many ISAs do you have? I heard a pretty big number here a moment ago. Yeah, so we have uh, seven ISAs. Um, I'm Brendan Bardick with the Bardick Group at Keller Williams Real Estate. Um, we are, we'll, we'll do about 350 transactions this year, uh, about 150 million in volume. And uh, we're kind of switched gears about a year ago, trying to build it all around our ISA department. Uh, which we believe is probably the smartest way to do it. So first of all, tell, oh, go ahead, Shree. Now, I was just going to ask, which part of the country are you in? Uh, Denver, Colorado. Denver. All right. Awesome. Okay. I just want to know that. <laughs> Wonderful coaches <laughs> and clients. It brings into perspective, depending upon if you're in a huge metropolitan area versus where Helixson lives. Whoa. Whoa. Hey, it's not Bentonville. Come on. Well, it may not be Atlanta, but it's definitely not Bentonville. Come on. Okay. So. But it's similar. Denver's a good area. I love Denver. Yeah. So really, here's what I want to know. You just said, okay, you, you have been pr migrating your model to a very solid ISA-driven model. You're doing about 330 transactions, and you've got seven ISAs. So first of all, I want to know, why have you chosen to drive it toward an ISA driven model? What's caused that? And what have you seen change in your business as you've been doing that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the reason we went to the ISA model was simply because we had, we're very good at generating leads uh, as agents, but we're not really good at nurturing and following up with them. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we had uh, in house department that was taking care of every single lead we had and making sure that that process was going from start to finish. Uh, we have a very detailed way on how we process every single lead. Uh, and I use the word processing, meaning obviously when we talk to clients from start to finish on, you know, getting them to convert into a uh, sale or into a referral. So with that, the agents were so busy running around, showing properties, taking listing appointments, that if we didn't have somebody in-house doing the follow-up, then it was very difficult for them to, refer the agents to have time to get to that lead follow-up. So, okay. 
Yep. Go ahead, Sheree, go ahead. Okay, um, so we've got a lot of people, a lot of people that are watching are gonna be in the very beginning stages of this. So if you can just back it up a little bit, where were you guys at when you, prior to hiring the ISA? So prior to hiring the ISAs, how many transactions were you all doing? Uh, last year we did about 260. Uh, okay. 260 uh, transactions. And, um, at that point we had started the ISA department last October. Um, and now we've just focused directly on building that and using uh, the, um, it's just a model. We're just following a very specific system to make sure that we can take care of the client and support enough appointments in our agents to have great success. Thank you. Sorry. Less than, so this has been less than 12 months? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, okay. um, yeah, we went to the ISA model. Um, yeah, about, it's, yeah, about eight, yeah, last October. Okay. And is it a so far, sorry, I'm just, I'm sorry guys, hold on. Is it a so far on the 350 or your projection is 350 for 2019? Yeah, no, we're on track to do 350 this year. We're at about so, five right now. So this model that you've put in place and started to get everything drilled down, I'm sure that we're going to dive into all what that means, but that has changed your business by a hundred transactions. Yeah, no, it's, it's changed everything dramatically. Uh, in addition, because what, what we were doing previously is we were really good at hunting down business and we really switched gears to a lot more balance where we're doing a lot more marketing, TV, radio. Um, but with that spending all that money on advertising, I had to make sure that we had somebody that we could trust in a department we could trust to make sure when those leads came in that they were being fully addressed as quickly as possible instead of with the agents trying to take them on the fly or them showing buyers and trying to answer a phone call when they're in between showing houses or listing appointments. So yeah, it was kind of a combination of, hey, if we're going to be spending, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars uh, a month in um, advertising and lead generation, I definitely want to have somebody in house that can address those leads. Yeah. So here's my question, because I think it's an important question. You said model. So I appreciate that there are, but there's probably 27 different ISA models. So I, I and I don't, and I don't know if Sheree had another question, we cut her off, but I don't know what your model is because that's a, that's too big for me. I, so tell us a little bit more about what that means. I mean, are they incoming? Are they outgoing? Are they both? Does an agent ever talk to a lead first? What, yeah. what is the ISA model for, for you guys? Yeah. So the ISA model for us is when any lead comes in, um, well, first of all, their day starts with outbound prospecting. So every ISA kind of goes through their check down of expireds for sell by owners, uh, rent by owners, just listed, just sold, uh, and even their sphere. Uh, and they go through that check down. Uh, during that, each one of them at different times is in a round robin for incoming leads, uh, whether it's from our phone system. So we use a, a dialer or a, a inbound system called CallFire. So CallFire, when someone dials our main phone number that's on any of our radio advertising, TV advertising, digital advertising, that rings every ISA's phone at the same time. Whoever answers that phone call first, obviously, or answers the phone first, gets that lead. Uh, it also records all the calls, so you can go back and do that for training later. Um, and then the standards that we have for every ISA is 30 contacts a day, 150 a week, uh, and that they register and put into the system at least two leads into our database, uh, which would mean a lead means somebody that's going to buy or sell in the next 60 to 90 days. So hold on, how often the two leads? Uh, every day. And then what was the weekly goal? So you had 30 contacts per day, two leads per day. Per week. What's that? 150 contacts per week. 150 contacts per week. Okay, keep going. And yeah, two leads entered into the system per day. Um, their goal for every month is 24 appointments set, 18 appointments kept. Um, and then uh, their goal is to have six closings a month. Okay, so when we're talking about... Wait, 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 wait Shree, I, I, I want to make sure I get these numbers all down correctly. All right, so I got 18 appointments kept. How many appointments set, and, what, what, and that's during what period of time? Uh, one month, so 24 a month. 24 set and 18 kept per month. 
yep. kept because obviously some people flake, whatever that scenario might be. Okay. Um, and then uh, six closings per month. Okay, go ahead, Sheree, sorry. So I want to make sure that when we're saying contacts, mm -hmm. what's your definition of a contact? Because a conversation about real estate. A conversation about real estate, not wrong number. Yeah, not you, the little kid answered that mommy's not home, not I don't speak Spanish, not any of these things. Yeah, it would be a conversation, even if the conversation went good or bad, a conversation about real estate. Okay. 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 So, go ahead. You have something, Allison? Well, I mean, here's the thing. First of all, what I'm seeing here is I, I love what you're doing in terms of the, the ISAs. You've got some really good standards for them. You're obviously inspecting what you expect. So you're going through and you're, you're looking at what are they actually doing on a daily basis, which I want to know about that too. I want to know what's your daily accountability look like. So do you have a daily huddle? Do you have a, a spreadsheet? You know, what are you doing for daily accountability? And the other thing I want to know is I want to know about agent splits. If I'm doing this heavy ISA model, uh, and I'm, I'm paying now these ISAs to do in large part what agents used to do. Uh, what does that look like? How does that change the, the compensation model for the agents? So start with daily accountability and then go to comp model. Yeah, no, absolutely. So daily accountability. So we have uh, an old school, just daily tracking sheet that I can share with everybody later. Uh, we also use a program called CTE, uh, which is a just a beast of a Excel spread sheet that's a company produces. I, I, I can get the information out for that as well. It's like 30 bucks a month, but um, they track everything throughout the day. So what kind of contact it was, how many contacts appointments set, where the source of the lead was. Um, and then every day we have it in live time where we can have accountability to say, okay, hey, this is where you're at. This is not up to par. Um, we need to make some adjustments, you know, quickly. In addition, um, uh, on a daily basis, uh, everybody has morning huddle. Uh, so the ISAs have their morning huddle every single morning at 9 a.m. Uh, they start at 7.30 because they have uh, affirmation script practice and then they wanna be first to get the expireds by 7.45, 7.50. Um, and then so by that time that hour's over, that nine o'clock accountability becomes that time to, uh, we call it a stand up where they can talk about, hey, what we're going to attack today, where we're at, are we above pace, behind pace, what's working. We also have daily live role play every single day at 12 o'clock in our training room from 12 to 1230. Every day is a different theme. So Mondays are more appointment Mondays, Tuesdays are technical Tuesdays. Um, Thursdays, we kind of do a, almost a game show format where we have two of our agents or ISAs get in front of the uh, training room and have their backs to us. And we just fire out objections at them and whoever answers and gets to three points first usually wins a prize. Um, because we know if we can master those objections and we can be quick on how we respond to people, then we can continue those conversations. So for us, role play is probably one of the biggest keys that I think has helped us this far. Okay, wait a minute, hold on, back up now. I'm just, dude, I'm taking this all in. I'm loving what you're sharing. This is actually really valuable stuff. Uh, and so Monday is, what is it? More appointments Monday? More appointment Monday. More uh, appointment Monday. All right, Tuesday? Yeah, technical Tuesday. And Tuesday is more about explaining every type of, you know, everything from title insurance to FHA financing to, you know, anything that would be a technically related question about real estate, we focus on that. Um, and then, um, yeah, Thursday, we have it's called Thursday Throwdown. It's a competition where everybody gets into, like I said, almost a game show format. And then Friday is Freestyle Fridays, where we put away the script books and try to just fire off things by mem from memorization. Okay, hold on. So that's no script books. And what was, uh, what was Wednesday? Uh, Wednesdays, we don't have it on Wednesdays because we have our team meeting on Wednesdays. Okay, and which one was the role play? I'm mean, sorry, not the role play, the objection handlers. Uh, Thursday. Thursday. That was Thursday. All right, uh, objections. Okay, perfect. All right, Brian and Shree, go ahead. I'm sorry. This is good stuff. I'm freaking loving this. I mean, at the end of the day, here's what you, let me tell you the first and foremost, the thing that I love about what you're doing. <laughs> well, what I miss, Brian. Brian, sure you go, and then you start talking. <laughs> well, you didn't say anything. I'm like, all right, if you're not going to say anything, I'm just going to go. You got to jump in, man. Do you have something to go? If you got something, go for it. Let me hear it. Uh, here's my question for you, because you, this is not, this is a new model to you. Obviously, you're having success with it. You like it. Here's the objection to the ISA model, and I'd kind of like to see what your, your team has done with it, what the problems have been. Um, and, and I do believe what I'm about to say, there is a discrepancy there, and there is a disadvantage, but 
sometimes the, the other advantage outweighs the disadvantage. Here's the disadvantage. So the very first person that I personally like to talk to a client theoretically on an incoming lead is, is an agent because that agent can, you know, build that rapport and do that. So at some point in time, I'm guessing, you know, prior to October, that was, that was your model. What advantages and disadvantages have you seen from that switching so that, you know, it's not, it's, Hey, I'm so-and-so's assistant or, Hey, I'm so-and-so with this versus I'm a real, <clears throat> I'm a real estate agent. I can go show you this house in the next five minutes. So yeah. I'm exaggerating, but that, that's an important question to me. And I think for our audience. Yeah, no, completely understand. I think a lot of times people, the reason we get caught up in the, um, I guess if you want to say, I, I try to sell that we're selling a system. We're not selling an individual agent. We're selling a system. And with us selling our sales system or our buying system, there's everybody's trained at such a high level that it doesn't matter which one of you, us you get, you're going to get that same level of service regardless. So before when you trusted every agent, and we do of course trust our agents to make good, you know, good rapport with the clients and all that. But what we found was is as you guys know, I'm sure the lag time on lead conversion could be anywhere from zero to 650 days. And mm -hmm the cost of every lead that we were producing, knowing that they weren't getting fully addressed and fully processed, and even for the agents understood that, hey, I can't, I can't get through a database of 500, well, not that they can't, I don't want to get through a database of you know, my 500 and make those kind of calls. Um, the way that we implemented the program was the ISA program is in, in addition to, it's not, hey, we're trying to take away from your business or we're trying to do anything else. It's we want to add another level here that will make it so you can do what you like to do best, which is negotiate contracts, work with clients, make them happy and get to the closing table. Okay, so one of the objections that we've had a lot of when it comes down to people who are looking at doing the IS system, system is the training and the high turnover, you know, for that position. What has your experience been when it comes down to the turnover part? Because I can see where you have the training part uh, built in, but in reference to the turnover, what's your experience been? Yeah, no, it's a learning curve. I mean, I always, you know, think same thing, fail fast, fail forward, right? So we've learned a lot from every single hire we've done. Um, we, we understand the system a lot better now than we ever did before. And it's, it's really just trying to get a a grasp on not everybody's going to be the right fit for this role. Uh, a lot of people want to do this role because at some point they want to become a full-time agent. They just haven't gotten to that point where they can make that jump yet. So what we try to find are people that have those kind of big long-term goals that want to have a huge life and see this as a doorway to get to, you know, that next step. Um, and we've been pretty lucky with it thus far. Uh, but we've also had, a number of challenges and we've had uh, unfortunately to say goodbye to several ISAs for multiple reasons but every single time we we've, we've done that we've learned a lot more and I feel like right now we're still in our freshman year um, I think as we start to really refine the program we've just reached out to others that are doing it at a very high level and really tried to mastermind with them as best we can to try to get those shortcuts instead of just hitting ourselves upside the head every month. Yeah, I love that. We're, you know, we are built on a lot of mastermind. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I believe that learning from those who are doing it better, faster, and I don't have to repeat those mistakes that you repeated is, is wicked smart way to do it. So am I hearing you correctly? Is this a way for, for them to step up to being an agent? So are you running a model where they start off as ISAs, yes. moving into a showing assistant or and then a buyer's agent or something similar to that? Absolutely. So we have both paths. So um, we have what we call permanent ISAs and not to use the word permanent, but meaning that they're not coming through in a transition. So for any agent that now joins our team, you start as an ISA no matter what. Um, we went to that model simply because twofold, it was the ability for us to 
have that person in a controlled environment where they could focus strictly on learning how to lead generate and be successful in lead generation. It also gave us the ability to make sure that we could teach them how we do our process 100%. And then it also gave us the ability to evaluate them during that time frame. And if we felt for any reason that they weren't going to make it long term, we can also say, hey, this isn't the right fit for you and help maybe we can align you with, with someone else because you're not going to you're not going to make it with us. So how many um, people do you have on the team that are full-time agents that aren't ISAs? Yeah, so full-time agents, we have about nine full-time agents right now. Wow, awesome. so nearly a, nearly a one-to-one -one ratio. That's, that's pretty impressive. That's good. Yeah. And that's really what we're trying to get to is what we realized is if we can have one ISA per two agents is really probably the, the, the sweet spot of what we're looking to have there. Um, and what we've really created is if you think about it, it's a very simple model to an individual agent where at some point they need leverage, which would be that first hire, which would be usually their executive assistant. And what we're doing is we're producing that for them inside without them having to manage it so they can have more free time and more leverage to do what they want to do. And they don't have to go out and hire somebody and do all that and deal with payroll and deal with taxes, you know, all that stuff. We, we just are really trying to make sure that the agent is enabled to do what they do best, which is go out and sell houses and, and have great success with that. And then also, what can we do to take our agents to the next level? So some of my agents are buying investment properties. We're really trying to, we, you know, and, and with Keller Williams, one of our biggest things is that we're always just trying to have people have several different revenue sources. So it's first, let's get you ramped up to selling consistent real estate. Then second, what can we do to take it to the next level? You know, it's interesting you mentioned that, you know, first of all, I love everything you're doing. I love the model uh, and I love that you are very, very consistent with the application of it. That's something that I think is missing in this industry. You talked about making sure that they get to some level of consistent income as an example. Look, it's everything in our business we got to get consistent about and people really struggle with that. Now, we have a couple of questions from the audience I want to make sure we get to as these people are still on. Uh, and uh, by the way, you guys, those of you that have questions, type them into the Facebook chat here and uh, we'll get to those as quickly as we can. Uh, one of the questions that we had from Dana is a great one. How many different lead generation sources do you have uh, and what are they? So like, who are these ISAs calling? I've, obviously, you've got some inbound leads. We'd love to know. Yeah, I heard you talk about TV, radio. Uh, what else you got? Yeah, so um, we use several different sources. So we have um, Zbuyer is one of our sources. Uh, Zillow, of course, is one of our lead sources. Um, and uh, we probably have, as far as our own, so we do our own in-house digital advertising, when I mean digital. So we're constantly running our Facebook ads, our own pay-per-click ads. Uh, we offer an instant offer program, which we've had a lot of success with uh, of getting a lead capture. Uh, we offer a sell your home in 60 days guaranteed or we'll buy it program. So we have obviously a lot pushing to that. So we have a, a lease purchase program that we offer. So we have we try to just make sure there's a lot of different avenues on how we can capture uh, the consumer because not one size fits all. So, so it's just an all out blitz on how can we, and then of course then evaluating what's our return on investment from our lead sources. And then we've played around and we've kind of tried to find that balance that works for, for us to be profitable. So how many total lead sources do you have? I would say probably upwards of 30 to 35. 30 to 35. Man, that's a lot of lead sources. That's good. So we, we always tell people, if you want to have a six-figure income, you need at least 10 to 15 lead sources. You want to have a seven-figure income, you got to have about 25 to 30 lead sources to get to seven figures. That's dead right. Yeah, that's, oh. that's exactly it. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I think it's the other thing is just, again, not giving up on them too early. I see a lot of people, we start doing, oh, I, I did this lead source for a month. I did this for this. We know almost every single lead source works to some some point. It's just, but if you're not you're not in for it for the long haul, you're going to get frustrated and kick them out. All right, Shree, I know you've got a question. Before you go to your question, really quick. So uh, Dana also uh, was asking, uh, hold on, where did it just go there? What was Friday? Friday is Dana, our Freestyle Friday. That's where they where they're doing uh, no script book. They're just shooting from the hip. 
Uh, and so that being said, uh, you know, I'm all about the lead sources and I'd love to, I'd love to get a more complete list of all the lead sources you're using at some point, if you're willing to share that. Um, Mark, you mentioned that you would, you had left a team that was doing over a thousand transactions a year and started over about six months ago. And you guys had about seven ISAs at one point. Uh, and now you've got zero. What I'm the, the next question I have for Brendan and Mark. I'd love you if you're if you're still watching with us. Uh, if you could type this into your screen as well, and any of the others as well. What are you using for tools to recruit these ISAs? Are you using like we use WiseHire, right? WiseHire has been a really good source for us for a lot of uh, positions, both administrative and sales. W what are you doing to recruit people? Are you using WiseHire and other sources as well? Yeah, we're not using WiseHire. Uh, I have I've heard good things about it. We're using Indeed, we're using Craigslist, um, and we're using our social media outlets to let, I mean, most of, uh, a lot of our, our applicants that come in are because they've either seen us on TV, heard us on the radio, saw one of our postings, or they just, you know, they Google best real estate team in Denver, and, and luckily we come up as that. And they go, hey, I want to break into real estate. I used to work for Charles Schwab, or I used to sell pizzas, or whatever the, the history of that person might have been. Um, and then we just have a very specific interview process that, that we, we teach at Keller Williams, which is called career visioning, which is a four-step process uh, to hopefully make sure that we're getting people that are going to be not only a good fit for us, but we're going to be a good fit for them. Love it. Love it. All right. But what I'm hearing is okay. you've got systems in place that are consistently bringing in new recruits. And you guys, I, I hope everybody watching this, if you come away with only one thing out of this entire call, that one thing is probably the most important thing you can come out of here with today is when you're going to run an ISA model, you have to automate your recruiting process. You have to have consistent uh, recruiting happening on a daily basis, just like you would lead generation. If you don't have that because of the high turnover in the ISA position, you're going to find that it's very difficult to keep that position filled. And you're going to find that it's very hard to build synergy in that position because you got to have a certain number of these guys to have really good synergy in that position. Uh, and we'll get to that later. Sheree, go ahead. I, I want to make sure we get to your question. So um, since we're starting, we're talking in reference to bringing them in. Once they come on board, who's training them? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and that's what we've kind of made the greatest quantum leap on lately was before it was me, my director of operations, and that wasn't going to work. So now we have several different people involved. So first of all, the first day is always orientation with me so I can kind of break down the culture to them, show them who we are, what we want, what where we're going with the company. Um, then they get handed over for the second half of that day to our director of operations where we kind of get them set up on systems and tools. And then now we have two lead ISAs and we've, we've uh, made two, I guess, not to say they're managers, but two lead ISAs that are um, involved with the training and the shadowing and making sure that those new ISAs understand, you know, how to get to the next level. And they have been fantastic. Uh, Chelsea and Michelle who work with me are absolutely fantastic of bringing new people in and helping them get to that next level. Um, so yeah, it takes, it takes about five of us to actually make it work. I think in Corey uh, Smallman asked a question that I think you asked Michael a little bit earlier is, um, uh -huh. is, is the buyer's agent split less to offset the ISA for payroll? Because there's payroll, there's taxes, there's a lot. And that's a huge investment on your part every time you bring someone on if they don't work out. Yeah, so I'll break down the whole system because that's probably the question I get asked the most. So, so all of our ISAs are paid $3,000 base salary. Um, 3000 so 3000 a month and then 5% of every closed deal commission that they, that they get. Um, uh, we have a healthcare uh, stipend that's in there as well for uh, $250 a month. Um, but really the half or more majority of their compensation comes from closings and setting appointments and closing deals. Uh, then on our buyer agent splits, so buyer agents on any ISA set appointments are on a 70-30. 30 to the agents, 70% to the company. And just like you said, because again, there's all the costs, there's everything involved with the payroll, all of that. Really that agent's going out there, meeting the consultation, showing them houses and getting them under contract, which is still a big deal. Um, but obviously the hardest thing is, is getting to that appointment usually. So 
Um, so that's how it is on that. And then it's also on our listing side when we, and we have a listing division and a buyer specialist division. Um, so on our listing division, it's also based at 70, 30. Um, but the 30% on the listings is based upon the commission scale. So it's 30% if you get 3.2% or higher. And here in Colorado, it's 3.2 and 2.8 to the buyer agent. So if you get 3.2 or higher, it's 30%. If you get 2.8 to 2.8 to 3.2, it's 20%. And then if you get anything less than that, it's 15%. Because obviously we have so much cost on the front end of servicing those listings. Now we also have three full-time transaction coordinators that take the files from start to finish. I mean, yeah. our goal is to try to, and it's, and we're getting better every day, but our goal is to make sure that our agents, they're, they're, we know that they're happy when they're out with clients making deals happen, not in an office prospecting and definitely not in an office doing contract management because it's not what their skill set is. We want to have specialized people doing specialized tasks that all get to do what they enjoy doing. And when, when you get there, it's nice, but it doesn't come without a lot of issues to get to that point. So back in October, those nine agents that you have right now, was majority of them still in place or were they not still in place? Were they there back when you started this in October? Yeah. Yeah. The majority were, um, so as you said before, and I think it, you know, what Michael said is dead on, is one of the true takeaways is we have to constantly be recruiting for talent. And so we've had agents come and go, we have agents leave. We know naturally in the industry, it's gonna be about 30% attrition regardless. Somebody's gonna get pregnant, somebody's gonna get married, somebody's gonna just stop being wanting to do real estate. So our biggest eye opener was we have to stay daily and weekly actively recruiting for talent and then making sure that our value proposition to our agents, to our ISAs, and again, to our clients is strong enough to keep them there. Um, and I think we've done a good job with that. I think we're getting better every day. We've learned a lot, but um, yeah, in the beginning when we decided to go this route, we, we analyzed all the data from years past and there was so many clients that we had not followed up with that we had lost. It, it, the numbers were astonishing. I mean, they were absolutely, I mean, devastating. Probably a hundred transactions. Oh, easily. <laughs> Probably a hundred transactions a year. That's right. Easily. Yeah. So we, we just, we said, look, here, here's what we have to do because unless you want to traditionally, and I'm not saying this isn't the right way, but I was, you know, when I was trained, it was, you get up, you prospect from 7 a.m. till noon. You try to go on appointments the entire afternoon and into the evening. And yes, that is a way to do it. And is it sustainable? Sure, it's, it's I guess, somewhat sustainable. But what we would see happen is agents would, you know, do that. Then there'd be an inspection the next morning. There'd be something that they would schedule. They couldn't master their calendar. A thousand other reasons why they couldn't lead generate or lead nurture and they'd end up going through these constant roller coasters of um, incoming money, right? And I wanted to take away the, the, the money roller coaster from everybody and say, look, let's all make good, consistent money doing what we enjoy doing. And if we can do that, then, then it's awesome. But yeah, it's so, just to take out my, the inconsistency. My question was, it, it was a follow-up to that. My question, my follow-up question to that was, how much pushback did you get because you're bringing on a payroll plus you're reducing commission splits, all of that. And I can tell you from agents who are currently on a team and we have a vast majority of people who watch the show um, and a lot of them are probably team members. So the rainmaker and the, and the team leader understands why there is a shift in that to an agent on the team, they think wait a minute, I'm going from this to this, but you're only paying that. They don't pay attention to all the rest of it. So what was your pushback and what have they noticed since you guys have gone through this? It was huge pushback and the pushback is still every day um, <laughs> because, because at the end of the day, yep. again, they, they, we all want the same thing, right? To make more money and work less. And, and I think that's everybody's usual priority on what they're trying to accomplish. It took a while for them to realize that the ISAs weren't going to threaten what they were trying to do, that they were an addition to. And, and that's the hardest piece. And 
you know, that first time where one of my, my senior agents went out on a listing and took that listing and, you know, went to that closing and saw that difference in pay structure, he was irritated. He was like, yeah, yeah. that sucks that I'm only getting 30% of it or whatever that number might have been at the time. And he's going, I could have tried to do that myself. And then I go, okay, but you, you also wouldn't have had that opportunity if this person wouldn't have done this for you. So do you want to make you know, this kind of money by in addition to, and then behind the scenes, still push your own personal business in your sphere. And I'm going to help you do everything I can to get you where you want to go on the personal side. This just gives you the consistency to know if I get enough of these, I'm always going to make a certain amount. What I decide to do on top of that is on me. So I think it's just a matter. And we don't, and for a second, I can tell you, agents were like, Oh, I'll never do it for that amount. You're crazy. I'm not going to do this for that. And we go, and we told them, then don't, that's okay. I'm not, I wasn't forcing them to. I go, I go, I have people that will though, that see the value in it. So if you don't want to be a part of it, that's problem. Grandfather, I love you. High five. But if, if, (laughs) you know, like, but otherwise this is what we have to do because we're spending so much money. And if you don't care about the lead and I definitely can't necessarily fire you, I, I need to have some sort of accountability because I'm on the hook every month for the cost. That's right. So then how are you doing that when it comes down to, you've got so many different lead sources coming in. You have agents on the team that still want to hunt on their own, but then you have ISAs over here. So is everything going to your ISAs? Is it broken up and round robbery? You know, it's round robin to everyone. So it appears the team is 16 agents. You know, what's the, how does that work? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah. So no. So during the hours of 730 to four, uh, we have all of our ISAs working. Um, And after hours, we switch it over to the agents and on weekends. Now, we have started getting more where we have Saturday coverage for our ISAs, but we haven't gotten fully there yet. Uh, I wanted to just dominate the work week, get that structured, and then kind of go out from there. But so after four o'clock, the agents get turned on for the round robin and on weekends. And then that's decided upon who did, uh, who actually did what our standards were, which is Mm -hmm. track numbers and put your numbers in daily and we also measure conversion rates so if you're an agent and you're not really having high conversions you're not going to be turned on for those other hours to receive those leads um so the goal is is we still want to get every agent leads you'll hear people go well i want leads and win on this we go we want to get you leads but we really want to get you a set of appointments so if you can understand that or agent if you're going to come in and do 100 contacts a week and be consistent I'm more than happy to help you on any lead source you want to have. We just haven't seen it happen. They're just not doing it. Right. Okay. I think that's the key. That, and every agent, I think if you're listening to this, listen to what Jordan's saying. Jordan's not saying we're trying to take something. Brandon, away who's Jordan? You. He's thinking about, no, he was Brandon. reading the comments Brandon. from Jordan. He's talking, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Brandon. Brandon the comments, Brian. Brendan's not trying to take something away from you. And here's, here's a great mindset. And I heard this, I don't know, 15 years ago, and I've really tried to adopt it in my life. There's poor people think neither. Average people or, you know, middle of the road think either or. And rich people think both. And I'm not necessarily talking, or wealthy people is probably a better way to put that. So it sounds like on Brendan's team, I have, I have opportunities like, hey, I'm having a bad month. I'll pick up a whole bunch of ISA leads, go out there and kill those. Or you know what, if I want to work the heck out of my sphere, if I want to do this, and if you come in, all the people out there listening to that, you don't have to get stuck in this tiny little box of, oh, he doesn't want to pay me any money. That's not what it is. So let me ask you this, the average agent on your team who's just working ISA leads, how many deals are they closing a month? Um, so right now, again, with us kind of, you know, getting everything ramped up. So we have agents on our team that will do, you know, 60, 70 transactions this year. We have agents on our team that will do 10 to 15. Um, with our ISA listing department and buyer specialist department, we're seeing right now that those agents are doing about two to three ISA closings a month. Okay. Right? So for, for individual agents. And again, that's from starting the program in October. I always tell people it's kind of the same thing. An ISA is very similar to having a brand new agent start. You would love for them to just come in and be like, oh man, I'm setting all these appointments and it's so fun and it's so easy. Just like we'd love a new agent to do that. But it would be, it's a comparable that I say to people, every, 
imagine bringing someone in and saying, I'm going to, you know, you're a new agent. I want you to do luxury real estate in your first year. And I want you to only do luxury real estate. It's not possible, right? It takes yeah, some, like, it takes although some, they think it is ramped up. Yeah. They all think it is. Everybody's like, Oh, I'm just going to sell two houses a year and make, you know, cause I watch TV and do all this. So the ramp up time that we've seen, I mean, obviously the first three months, we didn't have a single ISA closing. Right. And so people were like, let's throw in the chips and let's do all this. Next three months, we had 30. Next three months, we had 60, right? And so as we start to progress, you just, the hardest thing I would tell any agent out there is you have to commit to at least 24 months in the ISA program before you're going to be a true believer. I would say even that first six months, you're going to be going, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if this is worth it. So you just have to really look at it and say, this is just like anything else. I have to build something. But what I tell people too, the love, the thing I think that that's great about an ISA department is I'm investing in people and I'm not just buying more leads, right? I could just go and buy more leads and then try to get my agents to have more deals, but then those leads are gone. What I'm doing is I'm investing in a program with leverage with people that are going to be there in a year or two that are going to be nurturing a database that's going to keep providing us leads in-house instead of us keep giving our money to Zillow or Amazon or whoever's going to try to dominate us later. So do you want to do you want to pay $300 a lead from Zillow every time you get a lead or do you want to have somebody in-house that you can trust that's doing that for you know. And we we're also doing other things too as far as seminars and you know, you know traditional ways of getting business where the ISAs are still there in place to nurture that business later on. So I think that what, what Brian, what you were saying is one of the big keys there is that the way that Brennan's model is, is that it's, mm -hmm. you can have both, you know, and, and that's the biggest thing. So one of the numbers that you said is that those who are using our ISAs are seeing two to three. So for me, and I can just talk about how my brain works for me, I would think, well, I can do five on my own and then I can get another two to three from you guys. And yes, that might only be at a lower commission split, but heck, I didn't have to go hunt for it. So it's like the gimmies, you know, who doesn't want the gimmies? You know, the lands, we're in the land of the op city leads where you're paying 35% out on top of whatever your regular split is with your team or your regular split with your brokerage and all of that. So it can get pretty expensive. I think it's a mindset thing and you are completely correct about that, Brian, that it's such a mindset thing when it comes down to agents and they don't understand so much that the ISA creates an immense amount of leverage for them. Yep. The one and, thing is time and time is money. And that piece right there that I don't have to do, then I can leverage it for something else. Well, and even, even with open houses for our agents that are having open houses on the weekend, our, our ISAs are in place to be doing just, you know, just what we call just listed open house calls getting them to have more people coming to their open house. But with that call, they're saying, hey, we just listed this beautiful home at 123 Elm Street. We're having an open house extravaganza this Wednesday from 12 to three, uh, you know, come, come check it out on Sunday. And oh, by the way, we know this home's gonna move pretty quickly. Do you have any interest in possibly selling after we sell this one, right? Like, so the, it's a win-win for both. And then the agents are getting more attendance at their open houses, which gets them more clients. So. It's, yeah, it's coming from a place of abundance instead of scarcity. But in the beginning, yeah, we had some, we had some scarcity mindsets there for sure. Brian, go ahead. Well, and I just want to, want to iterate. I think I, that, that abundance mindset is 100% what I'm talking about. So, you know, each person's at a different point in their career path. You know, it feels like, um, it, again, I love the both concept. That is so important to me that, you know, I'm, I don't know what your splits are and it doesn't really matter on the other thing, but I'm going to guess that a spear split is higher than an ISA split. I, I feel confident in that statement. That's this is how your model's set up. So, you know what? Great. Go close three or four spear deals a month. Go close things and stop worrying about commission splits. You know, we all, this has become very popular. Oh God, you know, what's the commission split? I was actually talking to a gentleman last night, 21 years old, talking about joining my team. He's closing four four transactions a month on the average by himself. And I said to him, I said, so, you know, what about the money? I said, you know, I'm going to pay, I'm going to take some of your expenses away when you join our team. But ultimately he's like, look, I don't, I don't care. He goes, I want to learn. I want to grow and I want to figure out how to create leverage. And I want to come and talk and I like what your team does and I like your environment and I like to learn from you. And 
you know what? And I'm not patting myself on the back, but there's plenty of good team leaders out there who, if you'd stop trying to do, again, don't be like Brian. I invented my own wheels for years and years and years. If I would have been smart enough to go and learn from other people, grow from other people. And this is what I told this guy. I said, look, come join our team for a year or two years and I'll help you start your own team because it, that's success for me. When somebody leaves my team and goes out and starts their own team, hopefully still at my broker. But even if not, then I can say, look, you know, I helped Bob and Bob was a great guy and we learned a lot and we had a win-win relationship for a couple of years. We're still friends. We still work with each other. Stop going like this and start going like this. Open up. And I love, I feel like that's what Brendan's really getting at. So thank you for that. We need more people who are thinking abundantly instead of this is yep. mine. Yep. Yeah. On that note, one of the things that I really like about the way you've got it set up, Brennan, is something I've been shouting to the rooftop for years, and that is we can't all be experts at everything. Stop thinking you can do it all, right? I love that you've got buyer <laughs> agents and you've got listing agents, and guess what? That's how it should be. They are two freaking different people, right? The person that's a great buyer agent is a nurturer. It's somebody who's going to educate and guide people and you know, walk them through the process and hold their hand the whole way. A listing agent... Dude, they're going to walk up, they're going to kick the front door down, they're going to punch you in the face, and they're going to make you sign. That's a listing agent. Look, when I was taking 50 to 75 listings a month, I wasn't pussyfooting around with it. I wasn't like a little kitty cat trying not to touch the floor, right? What was I doing? I was getting in there, and I was freaking going after it, and that's what you have to do as a listing agent. So I love that you're talking about that and that you've set yours up that way. I, I also love what Mark Menefil, uh just uh, mentioned. He said, split is small thinking. Uh, net at the end of the month, that's large thinking, right? And to Brian's point, you guys, it's not just about the money you make right now. It's also about what am I freaking learning? Who am I becoming based on who I'm hanging out with? And this is something that people very much underestimate because let me tell you something. One thing that you always take with you, I don't care where you end up in life, you will take with you the experiences, you will take with you the knowledge, you will take with you who you have become throughout this process. So guess what? Hang out with people that make you a better person. You're, you will Don't be going those bridges. That's a, oh my gosh. Did we not just have that conversation yesterday? Last night. <laughs> yeah, right? And so, I mean, but that's literally true, right? You don't have any idea what relationships are going to do for you down the road. I, right now you might be pissed off with somebody. Somebody may have offended you somehow. Somebody may have done you wrong. So what? Man up, cowgirl up. Who freaking cares, right? You got to learn that at the end of the day, People do stuff we don't understand for reasons we may not even comprehend or we might not have purview over, right? We might not have access to why they do the things they do. But what we can do is we can control who we are. We can be professional in light of unprofessionalism, right? We can be kind in, 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 in the presence of unkindness. We can do the right thing when others do the wrong thing. And when we take that tag and we, and we look at this from an ab a really, truly abundant mindset, but abundance does not mean the lack of diversity. Abundance does not mean that everything comes to you easily. Abundance means that you work your freaking tail off and that you build gr and grow all of the different five key areas of your life and that you're building something that's going to last. Instead of just working for income, you're putting some money aside for the long haul. I'm getting a little bit off track here in terms no, of- No, I mean, you're just doing the, the Pastor Hellickson thing. It's like, as soon as someone says, I separate stuff and I only have listing ages and buyer's ages, Hellickson's like, woo, Dude, thank you. It's like, this finally, is, somebody that gets it. Like, oh my gosh. It's, I mean, it just, it kills me that people don't understand this. Now, Stephen Marshall asks a great question. He says, how many ISAs do you have for say 30 lead sources? Or, you know, is there, is there a right number of, of ISAs per lead source or is it more how many leads you have coming in or what? Yeah, no, there's not the right number of ISAs per lead source. I think what it's more important is, so when we look at it right now, we have four permanent ISAs and three ISAs that are coming through as agents. So when I have seven ISAs, I have, I have four ISAs that are actually going to be there full time. And then, then I have three that are in the process of coming through during our our 90 day process to move out and graduate to become either a buyer specialist or a listing specialist. So as far as his question about how many leads do you need to be able to provide them, it's not necessarily about the amount of leads that you need to provide them. It's about, of course, if they can hunt, right? Because any ISA, the majority of our ISA set appointments come from expired listings. Um, so they're just, the reason the ISA is so valuable instead of an agent calling expires is because they have a full 40 hour work week to really build a system around expireds for sell by owners, uh, just listed, just solds, you know, rent by owners. 
where they can pursue them. With us as agents, I used to do it too. I mean, I used to sell 100 homes myself, you know, just myself uh, as a listing agent. I would call expires every morning, but I wouldn't call them the second, third, fourth, fifth day. I wouldn't call them twice in the same day. I wouldn't call them at 5.30 at night, right? And I was, and I still had decent success because I was one of the few agents in, in the market that would call expired. Um, but now these ISAs have the full time to, to do that full process. And so they're getting a lot better results than our agents ever could. So Mark mentioned, he said, and Mark, we're going to have to get you on the show one of these days, bro. Uh, but he mentions, he says, we found that an ISA can actively manage about a, an average of about 300 leads per month. Anything over that productivity diminishes. Are you seeing similar numbers, Brendan? Yeah, I would say that's pretty close. Yeah, because I mean, even, even kind of what I said before, if you're looking at, you know, even if you had 10 inbound leads per day for an ISA or even, you know, five, whatever it is, the, the conversion rate on what we're looking at is right now our conversion, and, and we're decent, is about 10 to 12 percent, right? So 10 to 12 percent of the leads that we have inbound are converted into an actual transaction. But the KPI or the key performance indicator that we focus on the most is how many leads do we need to enter in our system per every deal closed as a whole? And that number for us is 21. We know every time 21 leads are entered into our system and processed with our recipe, meaning our machine, you know, market reports, text campaigns, email campaigns, direct mail, all of these things are touched correctly. We produce a deal out of every 21 leads process. So Hold on. let me define leads. So you're, when you define leads, you're saying 21 people that are actively buying or selling a home in the next 90 days that you've had a conversation with. That is correct. Okay, I just want to make sure that I got that definition right. So keep going. And by the way, we got one minute left. So rapid fire. Let's hear. Let's hear the fi your final thoughts, and then we're going to go to Brian and Shree. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Again, it's just tracking numbers and having those numbers visible. So we have scoreboards everywhere. We have digital scoreboards everywhere. Where every week reviewing numbers, you have to be completely visual with the numbers all the time, or this will not work in, in the slightest. I love it. And by the way, you guys, for those of you, before, before we go to final thoughts with everybody, we have a download. And Brendan, tell us what's in the download that you prepared for us. If you go to clubwealth.com forward slash Brendan Bardic, you can get this download. So Brendan, what's in the download? Yeah, so these are our two lead flow charts. So this explains how we process a lead for a buyer lead, how we process a lead for a seller lead from love start it. to finish, our exact process that we use every day to convert these every 21 deals or every 21 leads into a deal. Freaking love it. And Sandy Stites is like, I'm loving this. Sandy's our culture coach at Club Wealth, man. Let me tell you something. You want to talk about somebody that's grown a team from nothing to rock star? I would tell you that she's probably got the team with the best culture in the country right now. Bar none. I, I, I would be shocked if anybody's got better culture than Sandy and David and their team. Uh, all right. So that being said, final thoughts, uh, Brian, and then Shree, and then we got we to gotta wrap it up. I just want to say there's different ways to skin a cat. And don't go in and worry about find a fit for you. If you're out there and you're going, I don't know if I want to be in an ISA model. I don't know if I want to be in this model, that model, go and talk to people, but always have an open mind with it because, you know, Brendan's got an amazing model and team that's working for him. Maybe you don't fit with him, but maybe you do stop worrying about, you know, this is my, one of my favorite sayings: stop trying to get an entire grape and take half a watermelon. And I think that's what Brendan's offering. So thanks everybody. Dude, I don't love it, Shree. Saying. I don't have a jazzy saying. Dang it, Brian. <laughs> got to think of one. But, <laughs> but for those that are team leaders, you know, I want you to just to listen to what the transition has been um, in just under 12 months for him on the team with implementing this. Now, there's we're not saying that this is easy, and, and, and of course he can tell you that it wasn't a snap of a finger. There's a lot of failing forward, you know, to this process. Um, but you do get to the other side and it's, and it can change your business. Um, but I know that I've talked to a lot of team leaders that are scared to implement this, um, even though they're right there at the door. So, you know, I always say, just kick it open and walk through, make sure you're masterminding with people who have done it, not who want to do it. Dude, so true. I'm so tired of people telling me what they're going to do. Dude, I don't give a rip what you're going to do. What have you done? right? Like, tell me what you actually accomplished. All right. So bottom line, guys, great episode. Brendan, we're having you back for sure if you'll come back. Uh, in fact, I'm going to challenge you. I would like to get you in contact with our office. I would love to have you, if you're interested, I would love to have you come teach a class for us at our listing, excuse me, at our, at our business strategy mastermind conference in November. So uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot in front of thousands of people, but I'm going to put you on the spot in front of thousands of people and say, <laughs> we'd love to have you speak. So the, 
<laughs> Dude, you'd be fantastic. We'd love to hear everything you have to say. This has been a great episode. Uh, and the bottom line for me, this is the last thing I'm going to share. The, number one, it's two, it's twofold. Number one, you guys, take freaking action. Quit acting like you can't do it. Quit giving the excuses. Quit saying, oh, that's not for me, or oh, I just want to be a solo agent, or oh, whatever. The market, the industry is moving in this direction, whether you are or not. If you choose not to participate in a team, whether as a team leader or as a team member, let me tell you something. You're going to get left in the dust in the next five years. It's getting harder and harder and harder to be a solo agent because you've got really, really, really smart people like Brendan implementing these models at a very high level. And let me tell you something, they know what they're doing and this, you got to do the same thing. That said, uh, also I want to give a final shout out to our sponsor, Wise Hire, uh, clubwealth.com forward slash Wise Hire. We love those guys. Thank you for making the show possible for us. And thank you for helping us with our recruiting. And for those of you that have not already done so, go to clubwealth.com clubwealth.com forward slash BSM. That's Business Strategy Mastermind Conference. Go to that website. Get registered for BSM. We have a ton of people signed up already for the event this year. It's looking like it's an awesome event. And who knows, maybe you'll get a chance to meet Brendan there. We don't know. We're going to try and talk him into it though. So have an awesome day, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, inside each one of you, there's a world-class beast just dying to get out. You got to choose to unleash that beast. So go do something world-class today. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Uh -huh.